And so Antoine Clergé. So Antoine is with CTO of One Access. And Antoine's going to talk to us about uh, have containers won the battle? So he's probably going to provide some proof points in terms of what I just spoke about. Um, Thank you, Azar, for the introduction. Um, so indeed, I'll be talking about uh, have containers won the battle? Um, and um, uh, I, I don't know if I'll come with all the proof points you're expecting, but uh, uh, I'll indeed uh, try to see if containers have won the battle for NFV. And I'll be comparing Docker-based VNFs with real VMs, or CNF with VNF, to get into the acronyms. Uh, but in the specific case of CP deployments, so I'll be focusing on that precise case for CP deployments. And by CP, in the case of NFV, I mean uh, universal CPs that do host virtual workloads, uh, so VNFs, and that can also uh, host uh, some, um, uh, some container uh, technology. So I'll, I'll just uh, take a step back and look at this new NFV trend, uh, because we have trends now and then, uh, on microservices and, uh, and containers. Uh, so let's take a step back, and uh, if, uh, you know, probably a number of you in this room remember the days where you would go to your next door store and buy your uh, Windows 95 box with a CD-ROM, and today we've changed tremendously the way we actually consume technology, and, uh, you know, it takes a few seconds now to uh, download an app, and you're used to uh, click and use to a, a wide number of choice uh, in terms of the application you're consuming. Uh, when network services are involved, there's still some way to go. Uh, and, uh, w you know, the whole work the industry is currently doing is to move from a world where, especially in terms of, uh, you know, CPs, we were used to design these CPs for a given service uh, with a design-to-cost uh, approach, uh, to all these new architectures where we're expecting a sort of generic infrastructure on which we can be very agile on services. So basically splitting a, a generic, reusable, cost-effective network infrastructure uh, to, very, to design network services in a very agile way. So if, if you look, uh, most of the big trends in networking uh, basically more or less address that problem. If you look at all the SDN initiative, you want a, a, a reusable data plane on which, uh, you know, the control plane can be very agile in defining uh, new services. Uh, so that's for SD1, SDN. If you look at SD-WAN, uh, well, uh, actually you have a, a generic underlay, which can be just the internet, on which you want to run, you know, services in an overlay. So you are a bit solving the same problem. And the NFV is trying to solve that, you know, by splitting today the hardware with the software. So at least that's... Uh, uh, that was the initial intent with NFV. Uh, maybe we can come up with another definition with containers, and, and we'll, see, we'll see that. Uh, just a word about OneAccess. OneAccess is a CP vendor, uh, so we've been selling CPs to uh, telcos. And our mission here is, uh, is to support our telco into this migration uh, to uh, uh, these new architectures, in particular NFV. So, as uh, you know, it was um, mentioned by the previous speaker, we're uh, starting from a world where initially we had embedded monolithic app running on proprietary networking hardware. That's what the CP industry has been optimizing for 30 years or so. So it's very optimized, but it's very rigid. And uh, we are currently moving to uh, a mode where we have these universal CP basically hosting the same application, but where, where efforts had been made to virtualize it and run on COTS hardware. So the separation there being uh, generic COTS on which uh, uh, virtualized workloads uh, are being run. It's flexible, but uh, a point is being made that it introduces a lot of overhead. It's much less optimized. Uh, it challenges the overall business model, et cetera. So hence the trend for microservices, as, uh, as pointed out, and we had you know, an explanation of what a microservice is. So it's much, light, much lighter. It focuses on a given process or a given function. And you want to host a whole bunch of them on uh, something that is much lighter uh, and uh, that is a container-based uh, microservices. So it's supposed to be uh, flexible and efficient. And the question is, is that the NFV nirvana? Um, so these magic containers do claim greater, greater uh, flexibility and scalability. And, you know, I sort of have the same diagram. Indeed, you know, you have these two OSs, 
you have uh, the hypervisor. So you do have a number of layers uh, on the VM side uh, that uh, justifies you know, that you do have an overhead compared to the much lighter container that share the same operating system uh, and uh, thus making it more scalable. And there is a point that you know, from a network and resource abstraction standpoint, uh, they're both basically on par in providing the same sort of abstraction to the, uh, to the application uh, running the network function. However, indeed, and I think that was pointed out, um, uh, there are a, a number of advantages pointed out by uh, container in terms of technical advantages. The footprint is one, uh, and traditionally, if you are, and you know, a figure, some figures were raised here, uh, where, when you will have a 30 uh, megabyte container uh, to host a given network function, the corresponding function uh, in a VM will take you, will maybe uh, hundreds of megabit or, or will be expressed in gigs. Uh, so the footprint, whether it's uh, a memory footprint or disk footprint, definitely uh, goes to container. Uh, another, uh, another element often raised is the boot time, the time it takes to actually uh, start, start up the network function or stop it, where uh, it will be in milliseconds instead of seconds. And then um, where, where it's obviously an issue if uh, you are in a very dynamic environment where you spawn and destroy uh, workloads. And uh, eventually uh, the throughput and latency, you know, well, they're it's more difficult to compare. I'll talk about this a bit later on. But typically, the figures you see is claimed to be better by 10 to 25 percent. Don't really know how these uh, figures and claims are made. Um, so it seems that containers uh, have somehow won the battle. But is that so simple? Well, actually, uh, the gap uh, and, and technology devolve. And uh, you know, on all the hardware virtualization, a lot of improvements have been made. Um, and uh, here we have an example of, uh, you know, in the case of uh, a very simple routing function, just to highlight, you know, to, to highlight the overhead, we've compared that with different technologies that have evolved over time. And, you know, the recent x86 processors have included a lot of these technologies to, to better support virtualization from a pure uh, throughput uh, and performance perspective. If you look, uh, the, the, the first case we've made on the simple, you know, routing forwarding case, uh, on a universal CP, if you look at a basic uh, Atom C2000, uh, you see indeed two orders of magnitude of what you can obtain using a container for that routing or using a virtual function if you just emulate a standard Ethernet driver as we used to do 10 years ago with an E1000 driver emulated. So it's obviously a, a terrible performance and you know, just introducing a simple uh, not real hardware virtualized, but a virtual virtual hardware with VertIO, then you, you save uh, one order of magnitude. It's a log logarithmic scale that you see here. Uh, so uh, first of all, we started removing these huge bottlenecks, the introduction of DPDK, and then uh, SRIOV uh, that you see in the recent generation of processors, basically on a pure throughput and pure performance aspect that what you can expect from a container and a VM uh, seem to be quite on par. Um, now, it's true that I haven't here uh, made any measurement and improvements in terms of boot time uh, or in terms of footprint, but uh, there are also a lot of work in the virtualization space uh, with lighter VMs and unikernels uh, that are emerging to try to reduce the gaps with containers on the, all these other aspects. So, you know, technology are things that move over time, so VM or containers, uh, in some circumstances, they may end up converging. So what is then the real difference? Is it just a choice of technology? Well, I think there is a major difference. Is in one case, you're abstracting the hardware. And in the other case, you're abstracting an operating system. So you're abstracting the hardware for a large application, or you're abstracting an operating system for the micro microservice. Uh, and you end up in two very different situations. The current situation is basically a, a situation where the uh, API uh, the abstraction API is the x86 uh, ABI, and that's driven mostly by hardware vendors uh, today, mostly x86 uh, Intel, uh, with a, a possible ARM arc, uh, alternative in the future. Uh, you know, some, some are trying to push for these universal CPs that are ARM-based. Uh, if you're more pushing uh, to the um, uh, second case, uh, which uh, uh, 
you would end up in a situation similar to the smartphone industry, where basically uh, the common API is a sort of operating system, whether it's the iOS for, for the iPhone or Android for, for Google. Uh, but you end up with basically your, your standard is, is the underlying operating system. So how will that translate to the net network and operator, uh, networking world uh, ecosystem? Uh, well, uh, first of all, you know, and that was mentioned, the first thing that needs to be done is uh, uh, quite a significant restructuring of uh, the networking software by the vendors, some of which have engaged in that journey that, uh, you know, that was, uh, and we called uh, that uh, componentization, uh, as it was uh, previously mentioned. So transforming this large monolithic app into a component-based, uh, series of component-based microservices. Uh, and uh, most likely also the independence of underlying kernels because a lot of uh, you know, these VNFs have introduced over time either proprietary kernels or proprietary patches to the kernel. Uh, so that's uh, another uh, sometimes challenges uh, when moving to microservices. If you also look at uh, you know, what is the API, it's, uh, it, it ends up being a Linux API, a much broader one, evolving quickly, used across a number of industry. So one of the questions that is then raised is, should there be a, high, a standard or a higher abstraction on top of just this Linux API be defined for NFV? And, and indeed, um, you know, uh, how, who, would that, who would support that? There are a number of uh, open source initiatives uh, in the NFV world in general. Uh, you know, uh, uh, companies such as Red Hat would be uh, an ideal candidate to support a sort of standard like that. So I understand they, they, they would more support a virtual OS API than if, it, if we had an Intel speaker here. But uh, uh, there is, uh, I think, a, a difference in where you end up uh, for the industry. The last consideration, I think, was mentioned. And I'll be glad to have a discussion with the previous speaker on the security aspect. Um, if you just look at uh, 2017, uh, there were 553 kernel exploits in Linux. Uh, and the containers do share the same kernel. Uh, I just uh, name one here uh, where you can escape containers and get into the uh, into the host or get into other containers uh, using a, a, a Linux system call. Uh, so uh, as you see uh, on the graphs on the right, you know uh, Linux is still something consistent, well, growing over time. Uh, the number of system calls is something between 350 uh, to 400 uh, today. Uh, the number of lines of code is consistently growing, so it's becoming increasingly complex. And if you are sharing the same kernel and you believe that some containers may be misbehaving uh, containers, uh, then the security is nevertheless uh, quite a significant concern. So what used to be in, in, in the previous case of a VM, multiple layers introducing overhead, in a security context, these multiple layers are also barriers uh, in terms of, uh, of security. Uh, the second point that can be made is, uh, well, you end up having your network functions, so your CNF having a dependency, obviously, on your lying OS. And when you actually need to patch that, um, then uh, the dependency with uh, the uh, containers that run over that uh, may, be, uh, may be an issue, which uh, patching the hardware, on the other hand, uh, is, uh, and changing the a a hardware APIs is something that you're not really likely to see, although there are also some security leaks and, you know, the well-known, but probably more rare concern with Meltdown, uh, you know, is shown to be uh, also uh, a vulnerable point. One thing that we need to look at is if we look at the universal CP use case and the reason why, you know, the, the enterprise wants a network function hosted in its premises, the security is probably the number one use case. So security is just not something we can ignore if we're trying to compare containers and VM in the context of a CP deployment. Um, so, uh, I'll try to look at what is the approach we'd be proposing for universal CPs. So let's summarize a bit this battle. Uh, VMs best for, uh, containers best for. So of course, containers are uh, made for uh, lighter workloads uh, that, and, and that are much more dynamic. They spawn, destroyed, uh, very well suited when you have uh, multiple instances of the same service. Or, uh, or you have uh, uh, multiple services this sharing the same uh, underlying OS. Uh, whereas, on the other hand, uh, VMs are still uh, the easiest way to go for existing large applications. And you made a right point. If it's to bring a container that uh, takes a few seconds to boot uh, and, uh, and that is as large as a VM, you may as well provide a VM uh, and not tick your container box. Uh, 
so uh, if you look at uh, security services running on some vendor's secured OS, you know, your, your, the security of your OS is a key point if you're a security vendor. So uh, for all these security workloads, uh, it probably makes sense just, uh, just in terms of security uh, to, uh, to actually uh, run in a VM. And this is where you may end up in the end having containers in VMs, and I'll come back to that. Um, the issue of persistent storage, uh, which you're more likely to have probably also in, in these uh, sort of environments, so in these UCP environments, which are not so-called the cloud native environments, uh, make also make sense for the VM. So in the other hand, it's not surprising. I think containers are a way uh, that are uh, uh, that is taken by all the you know data center initiative, uh, even even pushing that at the edge. Uh, in terms of customer premise equipment, uh, VMs still have a role to play. So what do we propose? In case of the universal CP, uh, resources are finite and they need to be controlled because they're uh, very scarce. So we are proposing basically a, a hybrid approach. I think it's important uh, in the case of the universal CP to identify isolated domain, whether these are the universal CP host operating system uh, that performs a number of functions to deal with all these workloads uh, that are co-localized here in the case of a universal CP most of the time, except in a, few, in a few type of different architecture, but most of the time there's this host operating system dealing with the VM, VM workloads. Uh, and these can host microservices, but packaged by the UCP vendor. So this is one domain. You may have another domain, which are these large VNF, in particular these, uh, you know, these security type of uh, VMs, uh, that may host uh, several uh, uh, CNF uh, in the context of this large VM. Uh, the benefits of that approach being that the domain of responsibility and security are clarified. The unification of operating systems are not re yet required, and then the industry can take the time it needs to smoothly migrate with um, microservices within, uh, within each VM. So we've actually, that's a typical approach we've taken for our universal CP, and uh, welcome, uh, uh, I welcome you to our booth if uh, you want to have a further discussion or a deeper dive into that, where uh, our universal CP building the virtual topology actually integrates containers and microservices, in particular for the management of this virtual topology. We have a, you know, a function like a DHCP server, or you may imagine a function like a NAT function. These could be provided by the UCP vendor or by a, a third party. Party, but in all cases packaged by a, as part of the UCP package. Um, and the VMs, on the other hand, could host a single VNF and could in the future uh, move to uh, several microservices under the responsibility of the VNF provider. So if I were to conclude, um, containers are an interesting technology and definitely something that will grow in the future. Uh, as far as we're concerned on the UCP use case, not necessarily the NFV nirvana. Uh, some of the challenges remain, uh, migration from large network apps to microservices, uh, dependency of the VNF to a common OS, and security remains a major concern. Uh, and as I mentioned, the technology will evolve, and in terms of uh, footprint, boot time, uh, technology around light VMs are uh, emerging and uh, are also something to look at. Uh, but beyond the technology, you know, that maybe end up being comparable at some point, I think, you know, the issue of what is the API and how the industry needs to converge to some sort of standard uh, to foster innovation, that's the most important part. Because I think as far as UCPs are concerned, the, the, the use case for interesting network functions is the one that needs to be, uh, to be made. Uh, so this is why we suggest this hybrid approach. Uh, letting you know the core vendors develop their core, core functionality within a well mastered ecosystem, whether it's on the UCP host or on some of these large uh, VMs, uh, and relying on a, a, a sort of hardware abstraction layer, an x86 abstraction layer, which is uh, the one that is uh, quite stable, and on which microservices can over time be built within these ecosystem. Thank you, and I'm uh, open up to questions.